before we come to looking at the word tonight and the passage we're going to read, there's a couple of headlines I saw just this past week, or a couple of small items I saw in part. One of them came from a use of scripture in the United States. You might want to remember this in your prayers. There's a Californian governor who's paid for billboards to be put right across the state, the United States. And on the midst of those, he is quoted from the scriptures and the words of Jesus, love your neighbor as yourself. He's used it as an advertisement for abortion. Clearly, those words do not mean in any part or form. It's a very sad thing. and I think that governor needs our prayers that he would come to realize what he has done and know the Lord. I would also remember that. Just yesterday, I also saw a tweet. I don't see many tweets, but you know what a tweet is. It's not what a bird says these days. It's a little computer uh, phrase that comes out. And it was a, a message sent from a Ukrainian minister or an armed serving armed forces man, and he quoted from Scripture. And he quoted from the Scripture in Deuteronomy that says, Cursed is every man who moves his neighbor's border. And all the people said, Amen. And then he quoted the various captures of tanks and various things that follow. Just an interesting thing. One quotation takes it out of context. The other puts it in context. And uh, just to be mindful, you know, the word of the Lord will accomplish the purposes that he determines. And that's what we're looking at in part tonight, as we look at the book of Exodus, chapter 4, and verses 1 to 18. We read in these verses of the purpose of God, which God continues to tell Moses that he is going to commission him. But Moses is not quite so keen. We read in verse 1 of chapter 4, Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. He reached out his hand and caught it. And it became a rod in his hand. That you may believe that the Lord God, that they may believe, sorry, that the Lord God of their fathers And the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, Now put your hand in your bosom. He put his hand in his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was as leprous like snow. And he said, Put your hand in your bosom again. And he put his hand in his bosom again and drew it out of his bosom. And behold, it was restored like his other flesh. Then it will be, if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be, if they do not believe these two signs, or listen to your voice, that you shall take water from the river and pour it out on dry land. And the water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. And Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you've spoken to your servant, that I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. But he said, O my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, 
Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know he can speak well, and look, he is coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. So he he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God. And you shall take this rod in your hand, with which you shall do the signs. So Moses went, and returned to Jephro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go and return to my brethren who are in Egypt, and see whether they are still alive. And Jephro said to Moses, Go in peace. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Lord, again for the privilege of being able to have your word, to be able to read your word. Lord, we thank you for the liberty we have in this land to be able to purchase it and send it to others. Lord, we're mindful that others gathered in this way this evening in other parts of the world will have to do so in very much quieter terms. And Lord, many of them with very little of your word at all. We pray, Lord, that you would bless them as you would bless us as we now turn to this living word of God. May it not only live on the page, but may it live in our hearts. May it change us and do bring about in our lives that which you purpose. We pray, Lord, also that it will bring about in the lives of those who misuse your word a repentance, Lord, that they may yet come to know you as Lord and Savior. And Lord, that you will bless those who use your word aright, that, Lord, they may know the honor of the Lord in their lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking this evening at God's instruction, that God instructs Moses here. It's a continuation, really, of chapter 3. Moses is still at the burning bush. And we concluded last time at the end of chapter 3, saying that there had been enough said. For God had spoken to Moses in chapter 3. He has declared his name to Moses. He has promised to be with Moses. And he has revealed to Moses his very realistic plan about how events will unfold when Moses returns to Egypt. And God has really said enough. He doesn't need to say any more that we should be convinced that Moses should go if he was speaking to us in that way, that we should do what he asks. And yet, following Yet another recommission built into these words, for God has spoken to Moses in verse 10 of chapter 3, in the first instance, come and let me send you to Pharaoh. And then in verse 16, he says again, "Go, you will go. But Moses still disobediently questioned God's plan. That disobedience comes out at the point at which Moses makes God's anger very real in his own life. Now today, as in the days of Moses, of course God has his plans. They're not like our plans, plans that we put in our diary and we wonder how it's all going to unfold, we hope it to be carried out. No, these are the settled purposes of God and they will be accomplished. But we don't always appreciate those plans, even when God is very clear with us about what he wants us to do and what is unfolding for us. And we can continue to question those plans when we are unwilling to do what God asks, even though we clearly can't change those plans. Instead, we're looking tonight, though, of thinking about how we could disobey the plans of God. That would be a fruitless task. Rather, how we should obey God's plans, which we want to question. In the first part, we see Moses' disobedient questions as they continue in this chapter 4. And then the questioning of our own obedience we'll look at in the following section. So first of all, the question of Moses' disobedient questions. But he said, O Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you you may send. 
That's in verse 13. But before we get to there, of course, there are 13 other verses to consider before we get to that third part of his deliberate disobedience and disobedient questioning of God. First thing Moses does here in the opening verse of this chapter is Moses asks a reworded question. We like to reword questions when we don't like the first answer we get. God has given him an answer. In verse 18, God answered the question Moses is about to ask. They, then they will heed your voice, and you shall come, you and the elders of Israel, to the king of Pharaoh. So when Moses asked the question, suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice, God's already told him very clearly, they will listen to you. They will heed you. And they will come with you to the king of Pharaoh. But for Moses, this isn't enough. It's not enough to know the presence of God, the name of God, the plan of God. He kept thinking about this question, what if? In response then, God opened Moses' eyes to a visible demonstration of what would happen if the elders of the people didn't believe. He did this by opening Moses' eyes. Moses, remember, is hiding his face lest he should look upon the flame in the bush. But there comes a question, what's that in your hands? And that seems to be a trigger to me to, find, to open your eyes and look what you've got in your hand. Because I expect he's losing a little bit of comprehension of where he is thinking about things. And God speaking to him, you would tend to forget the ordinary things that are going on. He's probably gripping it quite tight, uh, holding on to this staff that he has led the sheep with. And he replies, this is a, a rod. God says to him, cast the rod onto the ground. Moses drops the rod to the ground, thinking that it will kick up a bit of dust. He does not expect that it will turn into a serpent. And at that, it's quite a vicious serpent. I take it to be the same serpent of which it turns into later on when Aaron casts it down. And Aaron's staff becomes this serpent. And his serpent swallows the serpents of Pharaoh's magicians who do the same. So this is a vicious serpent. And therefore Moses fled. He wasn't worried about which way he went now. He just got out of the way. And then God said to him, go and take it by the tail. Now you can take a snake by the tail. And some people do that in their work but it's not recommended when you're dealing with a vicious snake because you leave the head free to come round and bite you. I don't like to handle a snake anyway, and I don't imagine that was an easy thing to do, but Moses reached out his hand, and before anything else can happen, the rod returns, and the serpent has disappeared, as it were. But God has not finished. He gives him a second sign. Put your hand in your bosom. Put your hand in your cloak, in your coat near your bosom. And when, you put it, when he put it there, God said, now bring it out. And he brought it out and it shocked him, surely, to see that his hand had been transformed. It was leprous. It was disease-ridden, white as snow. And God said, put it back in your bosom. And he took it out again and he looked at his hand and then he put the other hand with it as probably as well and there's no difference. God showed him this sign. God made it clear if they're going to heed these two signs, Moses was now to do another sign, a sign not to be done yet, but a sign to be done when he appeared before the people. Go to the river, draw some water, pour it out on dry ground, and it will become blood. I don't know if you've noticed. I expect you have. I hope you're not too squeamish. But water is very different to blood. So these two, this would become blood. And that was Moses, God's answer to Moses' reworded question. Suppose they will not believe me. Here you are, Moses. There are three signs for this question of yours. Then Moses asked an eloquent question. He protested he was not eloquent, but it's quite an eloquent question when you look at it. Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you've spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Now, Moses may well have had some form of impediment. 
uh, something that slowed him down in his speech, some slur or whatever, we don't know. We've got the printed words in front of us and we cannot tell this. But Moses addresses God here as his Lord. It means he's addressing God as his master. And he backs this up by saying at the end of the verse, your servant. He calls God his Lord and he calls God his being his, that he is the Lord's servant. And yet it is abundantly clear that Moses doesn't want to do what his master is telling him to do. It's an eloquent question. Moses didn't believe that he was eloquent enough to address the children of Israel and Pharaoh. And as we noted on the last occasion, that's an interesting point to make given that he feels eloquent enough to speak to God. Nevertheless, that's what Moses says. Now we can understand that Moses is gradually trying the patience of God, who is very long-suffering, as he will declare to Moses later in life. And thus Moses receives a very straightforward reply. Who made man's mouth? He does not wait for Moses to answer. But he does say something that might be surprising to us even today. Or who makes the mute? The deaf, the seeing, the blind, have not I the Lord. Moses was rebuked not to call himself unfit for a task that God had made him for. And this is something that Moses must have understood later in life because that's why we have the opening chapters of the book of Exodus. It was God who preserved Moses' life in the river Nile, and brought him into the king's palace as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. It was God who watched over him in the wilderness. It was God who would be with him in the coming days. Don't call yourself unfit for the task that God has made you for. And for the third time, God says, Now therefore go, and I will be with you and teach you what you will say. But Moses has another question. He asks God for a replacement. But he said, oh my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may, you may send. Moses makes it clear what is already very clear to God. He doesn't want to go. But God made it clear that his anger was kindled against Moses. We are not told how that is the case. It may be that the flame within the bush burnt just that bit brighter and warmer towards Moses. Certainly fire was a means he showed his anger in the coming days and revealed his anger towards his people. But Moses was clear that God was angry. His anger was kindled. Yet Moses was still spared. God was not going to change his mind. But he did inform Moses here that he would now send Aaron with him. His brother Aaron was coming out of Egypt to meet Moses. We don't know whether this is the first time or however it works out at this point. He is coming out though. God tells Moses when he sees you, he's going to be pleased to see you. Unlike you, Moses, you don't seem very pleased to see me. It's not what God says, but it may be inferred. But further, God knew that Aaron could speak well. He doesn't have a problem. And Moses was not going to get out of the job because Moses was to speak to Aaron the things that God had told him. In fact, God was so intent on Moses being his ambassador that Moses would be as God to Aaron. Aaron would not be able to say or do anything without speaking to Moses. Now God gives his final instruction. The flame in the bush is that this is the last communication from that bush as God speaks through the flame. He tells Moses to go, take the rod that is in your hand and do the signs that I have shown you. And Moses goes. No more said, no more questions, no more answers. Moses goes. As we come to this, it's a very straightforward passage in some ways. 
Um, but we may wonder at its application to us in the light of what we considered on the last occasion. As we look at this, we see that this is now how Moses testifies to God's instruction of him as Moses asks those disobedient questions. And it brings us then to think about not how we can uh, ask disobedient questions. We are very capable of doing that without any instruction from anyone else. But rather how we can look at our own obedience. As we question our own obedience, we begin exactly where Moses began here with God. Suppose they will not believe me. We continue to reword questions God has answered. Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. And within the scriptures, we find just about everything we could possibly ask of God has been asked by someone before, or complaint of God has been made in some way. The question we most frequently seem to propose propose in the same way as Moses did here is this word, suppose. It's a dangerous question, isn't it? Suppose you are wrong, God. When you hear it in those terms, you begin to think, oh dear, I should never have asked this question. For it is a foolish question, and I mean that in the biblical term. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And so in this question, truly, there is no God. When we say, suppose you are wrong, God, we are not talking about the God of heaven. For the God of heaven does not make mistakes. He does not do things half-baked and think about them later. He knows what he's going to do and accomplish. And when he had said to Moses, the people will heed you, the elders will go with you to Pharaoh, that was exactly what Moses needed to know and sufficient. There was no suppose. And thus it is when we ask this question, suppose you're wrong, God, we're already on dangerous and dodgy ground. We show that we have a very little view of God and a very big idea about how big our problem is with God's plan. Nevertheless, God gave to Moses three signs, and these signs are still instructive in answering our question, suppose you are wrong, God. Suppose they won't believe me. Suppose this, suppose that. God used what was in Moses' hand, first of all, and he made it a serpent. The use of the serpent displayed to Moses God's authority over a creature identified with Satan, of which Moses wrote in the opening book of the Bible. God placed leprosy in the hand of Moses and restored it again. This disease is a disease that God would use to describe sin and its impact. And God displayed to Moses that he overruled sin. And finally, God told Moses that if the first two signs weren't sufficient, he should take water and it would become blood. And the joining of these two things together, water and blood, was frequently joined together in the midst of the sacrificial system of which Moses would later learn more fully. It seemingly was already present because often the sacrifice was washed of its blood before it was offered. So when we ask the question, suppose, God, you are wrong... We are often forgetting the same three signs. God remained in control of the serpent he made. It wasn't just the one that Moses threw the rod to the ground and it became a serpent and Moses was told again, take the tail of it and it became the rod that God is in control of. He's in control of the serpent. He's in control of Satan. He knows the plan that Satan has, but his plan will overrule the plan of Satan. God is not wrong in regards to Satan. God also overrules the impact of sin on his creation. In the same manner as he used the leprosy on the hand of Moses, he overrules the impact of sin. He overrules it by bringing about that wonderful salvation of his that is declared in that third miracle that Moses is told about, that third sign that God has provided of water and blood. And we are not left to think about merely the water and blood that was there in the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, but we take ourselves immediately to the cross. 
And we watch as a soldier thrusts a spear into the side of our Lord when he has said it is finished and has given up his spirit. And from his side there flowed both water and blood. He displayed that he had defeated there the serpent and the eradication of sin. God's plans are accomplished. Suppose you're wrong, God. But God is not wrong. This is what he has done to accomplish our salvation. If God has used his plan of salvation to save us and has fulfilled it thus, how would it be possible for anything we suppose to spoil the plan of God in our lives? God cannot allow it. He will not allow it. Now, our surprises, our questions may be formally legitimate. Moses was right to question that, that in part. He wasn't right to question God. He wasn't right to question God. And when we say, suppose you're wrong, God, in any thought or mind, we're not right. Because God is God. He does not make mistakes. That is further shown later on now. If we think about what we can attempt to ask eloquent questions. Oh, Lord, I'm not eloquent. (laughs) But we are eloquent. You know, when you're catching a liar, that one of the ways you can tell you're dealing with someone who's frequently lying to you is that they will often go into unnecessary detail. They will tell you more than you need to know to get them out of trouble. And they will fill you in the details that you really didn't need to know. Apparently, that's the way that many liars are caught out. And many investigators are put on the fact that maybe this person knows more than they are letting on really about the case than really what we need to know. In this case, Moses exaggerated his willingness to serve God. Oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent, neither since or before you have spoken to your servant. I, I, I'm willing to go, Lord. I'm, I'm, you're my master. I'm your servant. And she wasn't willing to go. Moses spoke with God, as Moses spoke with God, it was clear that he could be very eloquent under the right circumstances. If it was a case of a choice between him going to Egypt or not, he could be very eloquent. He found lots of excuses and reasonings why this maybe shouldn't be the best idea that God had ever come up with. He could be very eloquent. But it's also very clear as it's written upon the page of Scripture, and it must have been embarrassing in part for Moses to write, but here it is, that God knows when we are lying. He knows when we call him Lord and we don't mean it. When we say we're his servant and we don't mean to obey him. And we should remember when we are tempted to do this that God has removed all the excuses we can make from us all. That verse there, who made man's mouth or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing or the blind, have not I the Lord? Like Moses, No one should think they are unfit for the task that God has made them for. For God has made all of us. Look at that again. So many people want to say, you know, well, when a person's born blind or they're born deaf, then there must be something of evil that has taken place. No, God says, I have made. I have made. The blind person, the purpose, the plan that God has for you is God made. God purposed. You can't use your blindness as an excuse for not fulfilling what God has given you to do. And we who can see, we can't use our sight as an excuse for not fulfilling what God has given us to do. God has made us. God had made Moses for this task. Therefore, it should be the time when we get to this point of consideration of saying, well, actually, I should go now. Then, of course, we really don't want to go. So we can still ask God to to put someone else in the place. Some of us are very good at finding a replacement for what we don't want to do. Well, there's somebody else who's more qualified. Moses would have found someone who could speak better. God found someone, Aaron, but he wasn't going to replace Moses with Aaron. He still was going to use Moses as he intended. God already knows that we don't want to do what he asks at times. 
He knows what our real motivation is behind the questions, the delays, the putting off. But that doesn't mean that your actions can't make God angry. Moses' actions made God angry. Mercifully, God is a long-suffering God. He is slow to anger and slow to wrath. But Moses was aware that this was, God was not pleased. God is able to make his own feelings felt on the matters that we do not want to do. Equally, just because you don't want to go doesn't mean that God's now going to change his plan. God might provide you companions as he did with Moses, but he's still commissioning you to do the task that he asked you to do. He made you for this purpose. And God's final instruction from the flame of the bush for Moses was that he should take the rod that was in his hand and go and do the signs that God had shown him. And as we listen to ourselves saying, well, God, maybe there's somebody else, God replies this, you are the person I intended, and you should take what I have already given you and use it for the glory of God. You're exactly the person I made you to be. Yes, one day you'll be transformed, you'll be out of this world, and that's a different matter. But here and now, you are the person I've made you to be. And you have been given what you need, that you may use them for his glory. But the bottom line for Moses and for us is this. There is no replacement for you. There is no replacement for you. Some of us, we would like to get out of things that God asks us to do, but when we look around ourselves in the setting God has put us, there is nobody else to do what we do. You're the only nurse on your ward. There's nobody else who can do what God has asked you to do. You're the only Christian on your street. You're the only one who can do what God has given you to do. There is no replacement for you. You know, God can replace preachers easier than he can replace you in the place you're in. He can find people who can preach and teach his truth. But to find someone who lives in your place, in your position, and doing what you're doing is a unique thing that is not repeated in any other place. You are you. God has placed you exactly where he wants you. Yes, we all have our questions, we would like to get out at times of what God has given us to do. You just follow me home on a Sunday evening sometimes and I would pull over everything done in a day and think I never ever want to do that again. We can all feel like that. But we have to be careful. There is nothing we can suppose that will ever make God's plan wrong. There is nothing we can say about who we are that ever unfits us for the task that God calls us to. There is no replacement for us. God made us. God called us to himself. And this was always God's plan. God doesn't do plan B. This is plan A. He created the world. He knew that Adam was sin. But he had, before all this, determined to send his son into the world to save us. That was always the plan. The mess may appear as if there was no plan, but there was always the plan. The plan was through the line of David, through the children of Abraham, then the line of David, there would come a Messiah. And through these, the Messiah would enter the world, he would die on the cross, and when the Messiah returned to glory... Then the church would go out into all the world and preach the gospel. That's still the plan. and You and I are part of the plan. Well, we find in verse 18, it was time to go. You might be glad of that. It was time to go. Moses went. He didn't lead the sheep any further away from home. He may well have led them home at this point. He took them back to Jephro, his father-in-law, and he told his father-in-law that he needed to go back and see if his people were still alive. That's a bit of a white lie, isn't it? Found within the page of Scripture, he knew fully well they were alive. God had no more to say to Moses, and Moses was clean out of excuses. 
he had to go. Does that sum you up? When you think of the questions that Moses asked, the answers that God has given, you find that God doesn't have any more to say to you about what you're trying to get out of. And you really don't have any new excuses to make. Your friend, I don't know how Moses felt about it as he walked back to his father-in-law Jephro and knew that the road was leading to Egypt. But if he was like some of us, he might have begrudged every step as he thought about what he was going to have to go back to. He might have complained a little bit within himself and thought about how bad he was at talking and speaking, and you know there was far better people to use than him and all these things. But in time, Moses came to appreciate the fact that he was privileged to be the servant of God. But Moses also came to appreciate something even greater than that. Moses became the friend of God. You know, Jesus says in the New Testament, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. For all the things that we can say about reasons we should do what God asks, I think that's the greatest of them. Friendship with God. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Let's pray. Well, God, we thank you for the honesty again of your word. And Lord, we know that it is really a mirror so often that just looks back and we see our own lives within it. Lord, we could spend our time pointing out Moses' mistakes and we would be wrong to do that. Moses is placing himself here for us to see because, Lord, you inspired him to do so. That, Lord, we might see ourselves and also see you. We thank you, Lord, that there is nothing we can imagine tonight that's going to spoil your plan. Lord, there is no event or anything that's going to happen that can separate us from the love of God. Your plan is perfect. Forgive us, Lord, too, that we may think that because of our inability in whatever area of life, we are unfitted for the task that you have placed us to do. Lord, we recognize, as your scripture has reminded us tonight, whoever we are, you have made us. And as you call us to the life you've called us to, it is our duty and our reasonable service to fulfill that which you've given us. You've gifted us with those things that are in our hand, as it were. You've made us the people we are. Help us, Lord, to use them to your glory. Lord, we pray that you would continue to bless us as we go forward. Lord, as we may at times... Forgive us, Lord, but we may begrudgingly carry out our duty. We pray, Lord, in time we will learn to love being a servant of God. And you will give us that joy of knowing that we are more than that to you. We are your friend. Lord, what a wonderful thing and testimony Moses had in future days, that he was the friend of God. Lord, may we be your friends as we carry out what you command us to do. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.